Good morning, everybody. We have a really good turnout. We didn't quite know uh, how many people would be here. So we are, we are printing some more packages for everybody. Um, we're going to ask if you can share. Um, and if anybody does want one that didn't get one afterwards, we'll, we'll, we'll print some more for you and have it available. So we're, we're kind of just starting off, uh, as we can open back up a little bit more, just starting off engaging the community more and educating the community more about um, everything that's going on up there, especially landscaping, um, and today specifically palm and hardwood trees as well. So we're going to try to do these every month um, and, and bring in, uh, like today, guest speakers, uh, bring in some of our landscape vendors for some of their highlights, and just try to bring some education to the community, give an opportunity for everybody to learn some and, and ask questions in a general setting like this and uh, hopefully we can get, get some good stuff out of it. So I'm going to go ahead and open it up and invite uh, Liz Argot. She's with the Palm and Hardwood Tree Committee and on the Federation Board, and she's got a nice uh, presentation about the palm and hardwood trimming. reminder for everybody to turn down their phones uh, on mute or uh, you know have you, you just turn them down and mine's in the bottom of my purse and I hope it doesn't ring while I'm standing here good morning everybody um, it's great to see such a wonderful turnout um, we, you just never know especially with the life we've been living lately with COVID and Delta and you know and who knows what but Welcome, and in this section of the workshop, we'll be talking about palms. I know Keith said uh, this is the palm tree and the hardwood tree and palm committee, but today our emphasis is going to be on, on palms. This morning, we'll talk a little bit about flower palms, pruning palms, and the appropriate care of palms. But the uh, emphasis this morning will truly be on trimming palms. There are only two palms that are native to Florida, the sable palm and the parodus, 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 my expert has corrected me, parodus palm. The uh, queen ant that we're just, I did it. The queen palm um, is the palm that we'll be talking about today because we have a vast number of them in our community and the queen palm is not native to florida it comes from a soil that is mostly organic volcanic excuse me volcanic and um, this sandy soil in florida has absolutely no nutritional value that is necessary for a queen palm so we need to keep appropriate fertilizing going with the care of the palms. Just any old fertilizer will will not do the job. We need one more, three, four. Mm -hmm, we didn't. Um, that, and let me backtrack. That um, second and third uh, slide we put in as a, a handout for you with the information I'll be speaking about today. And I was not going to read that to you, so um, we're uh, capable of doing that. And so you can go back to it at a later date, which is why we intended to insert it. So now, uh, back to the topic at hand. Palm trees require a steady diet of several nutrients and micronutrients, particularly nitrogen, Potassium, magnesium, manatees, boron, and iron are all healthy to the critical to the health of the palm trees. The University of Florida Horticultural uh, Department has set the standards for care for Florida plants and trees. And they have done many, many years of research to, as a time goes by, they continue doing research. They're talking about, as you can see, a 360 degree head on a palm, about 15 
to 18 fronds. When the fronds are cut back drastically, they lose food producing ability. And we've all heard of the word of photosynthesis. For example, if the palm has 15 fronds and, yes, and 10 are cut away, it's the equivalent of being on a 3,000 calorie diet with Healthy Harry and cutting them back down to a 1,000 uh, calorie diet as poor old sickly Sam. The person who has had the 3,000 calorie per day cut to the 1,000 calorie per day, could, if this is prolonged, could get very sick and perhaps die. Uh, and this is the same with a palm, when you take the nutrition away. For example, as we said, the healthy palm and healthy Harry tells us, 360 degree head, full, green, and mighty majestic, and I'm properly fertilized. I'm not sure about the 3,000 calories, but if that plays a role in there or not. Now, the unhealthy and over, and I'll say this again, over trimmed palm, it looks like this. And Sickly Harry's pointing out what you need to, to pay attention to. Without the proper nutrition and the proper pruning process, you'll see smaller trunks at the top of the, of the palm. <laughs> Of, at the top of the tree and frail looking palm fronds. The University of Florida says never cut a palm back past the three and nine mark. And we've seen that for years. We've heard about it for years. The three and nine mark means the point where the frond is attached to the trunk and grows out from the trunk. So you do not want to cut beyond that. Now, the um, above that. Now, the thing that we need to remember is that the only time you should cut a palm frond that looks healthy is if it is on the roof of your house or causing um, obstruction and is in the way of uh, walkways, your car and work and it's sweeping the shingles on, on your roof. This is probably, in my estimation, one of the most important slides that we have today. You see the yellow, and if you're like me, like I was before my expert trained me, um, I see yellow on a palm frond and I go absolutely berserk. The tree's dying, get that out of there, and every other thing imaginable. However, as new shoots start to form at the crown of the tree, the bottom frond begins to turn yellow and then brown. What's happening? Well, Mother Nature is at work, and she's one smart lady. As the bottom frond the bottom, say palm frond fast, easy said the time. The bottom frond dies and turns yellow and then brown, means that the palm is pulling the nutrients from that bottom frond and feeding the trunk to feed the new growth. So yeah, that was pretty amazing when when I when I learned that. So I no longer get upset when I see a a frond yellowing. And after this process happens, only after, then you can cut that frond off the trunk, but never cut off a green frond. Okay. And to be sure, the health and the aesthetic appearance of our palms is maintained, we need to look for setting a standard for the proper and appropriate care and trimming of all palms in Kings Point. 
where you have them up and down main, the main roads in the community as well as in each um, association. By proper care, we'll have a much nicer looking palm landscape and we'll save money because with proper care and proper trimming, we will lose fewer, much fewer, of our queen, ant, queen palms. The, the healthy care will prevent them from becoming diseased and dying. So we will not have to remove as many uh, dying and dead palms, diseased and dead palms as we have been doing. In addition, uh, the way to maintain the health and the aesthetic appearance uh, standard for our palms is to be certain that we identify the appropriate vendor to care for our trees and have a comprehensive contract outlining and detailing the appropriate care and uh, trimming of our palms. And a tremendous need is to have appropriate oversight of the vendor to ensure our wishes in that contract are carried out. And that's all I have for this morning, so thank you all for coming, and I appreciate uh, your attention. And questions will be taken at the very end of the uh, program. Thank you. something challenging in the condominium life is just uh, you know educating every resident everybody's got varying opinions and also right tree in the right spot in this case developers like to put palm trees and oak trees in various spots which can cause uh, continued problems down the road um, in uh, older communities so that's always always a challenge when something's right against the house versus right in the center of the uh, of the lawn so Next, I'm going to bring up uh, Ryan Rourke, landscape specialist for Kings Point, and uh, run you through some uh, expectations for landscape vendors. Good morning, everyone. Um, how's everybody doing this morning? I, I am super glad to see this many people here. We didn't know what we would expect or how many people were going to show up today? Um, you know, we want to have outreach for the entire community um, in regards to the landscape. A couple of things. I'll start off with a, a little bit of qualifiers on myself um, and, and why I'm qualified for the job that I'm doing. Um, I do have Florida certifications for horticulture as well as best management practices. I am a horticulturalist by degree as well from Indiana State University. I studied turf grass science at Purdue University. Uh, so I'm, I'm very in depth with turf. Um, I've been in this industry for, for my entire life. The green industry is my passion. I, I love what I do. I love the outdoors. I like to consume landscapes and I, I like to see residents and other individuals consume their landscape. I mean, we, we want beautiful landscapes so we can go out and enjoy lower our stress, and, and just have a good time sometimes. Um, we like to hear the birds, the, the other critters that may be around. Even some pests we may like to hear, but we need to get rid of them sometimes. So on that, we'll go ahead and get started with some of the expectations. Um, one of the biggest things that I, I run into a lot of times is, is turf replacements. I, I get a lot of calls and concerns about bare areas, turf turning brown, things like that. So what we want to go over is what we cover under warranty, our vendors will cover under warranty, and what falls under the association's responsibility for replacements on turf. Uh, keep in mind that there are some exceptions to some of these things, so we're going to go over those as well. Some items that would be covered under turf warranty. It would be, for instance, if our vendors fail to provide proper pest management in the turf for chinch bugs, mole crickets, 
web worms, things like that. We do have a lot of pests out here. And I know some of you have been receiving emails regarding the web worms and, and informational pieces. We're trying to get our vendors to be more proactive in that communication aspect. So a lot of you may be seeing moths and stuff in the turf. I just want to let you guys know that those are not the pests that we're actually targeting. The pests that we are targeting are the larvae for those moths in particular. Those are the web worms. So we don't want the larvae in there. We want to make sure that we get rid of the larvae because they are the ones that will damage the turf. We're always going around looking for those areas. Landscapers, we do kind of grade them, we, not kind of, we do grade them weekly and point out where we see deficiencies and things like that. So they do get updates and we're trying to, and this is a tool to help them be proactive in addressing those issues. Uh, turf disease, sometimes we get some turf disease when we get really dry conditions and then we get super wet. That, that, is, that is ideal conditions for fungus, whether it be root borne fungi or, or blade borne fungi. So we, we have a couple of different kinds that we have out here that we usually see. One we call a brown spot. Um, that's generally gonna leave marks on the leaves or lesions on the grass blades themselves. And that's, that's how we identify that and identify that that is a turf fungus. And, and, and our, our vendors do have the products to manage those and take care of those. Sometimes they just don't realize that they're there until the symptoms present themselves. So then they have to treat and allow that to grow out. Um, we may be seeing some neon in, in some of those turf areas too. Some residents may think that that's due to a lack of water, but that is not the case. If we see neon turf, that is a turf disease called root rot. Um, that one is one that our vendors may not necessarily identify or even really know about until it does present itself and it begins to show the chlorosis and the grass blades. So we do get them to treat that and, and they do monitor it. We monitor it as well. Uh, and if, if areas of turf die out due to that disease, it, they are absolutely responsible for replacing those turf areas. Same with the insects. If we have pests that truly just ravage and decimate a turf area, our vendors are responsible for replacing that under warranty, not the associations. If there's any other negligence by our vendors, such as a chemical spill, um, they go through and their mower deck drops on them and they scalp the turf and they may be in that, and the turf dies out due to that, we want them to replace it. We don't want you guys to have to replace something that you guys are not responsible for. Um, when we go to uh, what's not under warranty, many associations, and we have an outline from our vendors on pre-existing areas. Now there's exceptions to this. So if our vendors do happen to grow turf back in those pre-existing areas that they've outlined to us, they are absolutely responsible for that turf that regrew. So if that turf that regrew dies out, that area is no longer pre-existing because they did regrow the turf. So we want them to maintain that turf, whether it was pre-existing or not, we want them to maintain it. Um, there are things that are gonna be outside of the vendor control, such as some pests that may be subterranean, um, nematodes, things like that, acts of God, any, any kind of nature incident that may destroy our turf that we don't have a control system for. Um, if there's new pests that may have been introduced into the community or, or into Florida that there's not a known control for, we can't hold them responsible for, for trying to control something that we don't have a control for. Um, if there's damage caused by other vendors, we've gone around and seen where painters have left stuff on turf. We've seen um, where, where some roofers have, have torn up some turf areas. We can't hold our vendors responsible for replacing those areas either, but the vendor who did do that damage should absolutely replace and, and take that responsibility up. Uh, we've had some tree vendors in here that have destroyed some turf areas, and you know my expectation is if you, if you ruin it, you need to replace it. Go ahead to the next one, Mobile. Um, some pruning. So pruning of our landscape beds takes place every 5.2 weeks. Uh, there may be some exceptions to this, depending on if the plant needs to be pruned or not, or, or um, some plants that may be flowering only one time a year, they may not exactly prune those, such as the exora and stuff, because we only get the, prune, the flowers out of them one good time a year. They aren't, they aren't blooming throughout the entire year like the hibiscus. 
we want to keep the blooms for you guys so you can enjoy them. And, and they do put hard work into fertilizing them so they can produce those blooms and give you guys that beauty. Um, hibiscus, plumbago, those will bloom all year round. So please expect those to be cut. And sometimes in, during the summer or winter times, we may go in and do a rejuvenational pruning on them, which may not look the best for you guys, but we are in Florida and they grow all year round. So they will flush back out. We're doing what is best for the plant. We, we also like to make sure that they're doing correct pruning or using correct methods. So we're going around and looking. There, there's some things that I see them shearing and we're trying to steer them in a direction to stop shearing these plants as, as it's doing more damage to the plant and to the inside of the plant than it is if they would actually be coming through and hand pruning them like they should be. Hibiscus are, are, are another example of something that should be hand pruned, not necessarily sheared. I am not a fan of shearing plants. I, I come from a state care, so I, I was very detailed. It, um, pygmy palms, um, some people, I get some calls and concerns about pygmy palms, whether they should be pruned or not pruned. Uh, to kind of touch what Liz said, we want the palms out here to be as healthy as possible. Um, if they're not healthy, they are sus more susceptible to disease. Um, a healthy palm necessarily isn't resistant to disease or won't get a disease. They just are, can fight it a little better, just like if we're, if we're healthy, our immune system fights better too. So what we have the vendors do is only clip the brown fronds, and we want them to keep the seed pods and, and flowers clear too, because we don't want you guys running out your doors and running into bees that may be feeding on the flowers and stuff like that. So we're trying to do what's best for the landscape and keep things tidy for you guys as well. If, if there's palm fronds on those pygmy palms that are, are intruding into a sidewalk or a driveway area, we either want them to take those fronds or, or tip prune them so they would just cut the tips off of them so that you're not walking through them. Uh, pygmy palms, as we know, they have spikes on the end of the fronds and we don't want anybody running into those either. They, they, they hurt. Um, go ahead, Mom Bell. For weed control, weed control is tough sometimes, but it can absolutely be done without question. We want at least a virtually weed-free landscape. We know we're going to have some weeds, and, and as I'm going around and, and checking these vendors, I, I'm looking at weed size and things like that. How big is weed? That tells us how long it's been there and lets us know if the vendor's been doing the job or not. If they haven't been doing the job, we want them to do it so we get them back out there to, to apply the product and things like that. And it, we want you guys to know that there are large areas of even grassy type weeds that may look like grass, but it absolutely is not grass. Uh, we have crab grasses out there, we have sedges, we have kalinga, um, carpet grass, things like that. I want you guys to know that the vendors must kill those. That is contractual. They have to do it. So even though you may have areas that you like and you, you, you may say, well, I'm fine with it because it's green. Contractually, we have to have that filled out. The vendors have to control those weeds. Um, and that, that goes to some areas. If, if, if it's not a pre-existing area and weeds have grown into that, then the vendor needs to replace that. If it was a pre-existing area, the associations need to replace those areas in order to control those weeds a little better. Otherwise, all our vendors are doing is just constantly reapplying product and that's preventing and, and retarding some of that growth that that turf could come back in and fill those areas in. Now, the turf can absolutely fill those areas in. However, because product and weed control is always being applied, we're stressing that turf, even though we're not killing it, we're stressing it. And if, we're, if the turf is stressed, it doesn't want to stretch like it should. So we want to try and encourage associations that do have large bare areas to, to find some way to re-turf those if possible. Um, there are some weeds that don't have means of, of selective control. Uh, right now what I've seen because of the rains that we've had recently, there, there's outbreaks of some torpedo grass in some of the associations and things like that. That's a rhizomatic weed, so there, there's no real control. We could put pre-emergence down, but pre-emergence are not going to control that or prevent that from coming through. And the issue with, with torpedo grass is 
the product that is used to truly control that is not allowed to be used in Florida. So that would be a selective herbicide that they could use if we weren't in Florida. So to control that here, they have to use a, 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 a non-selective, which would be like a Roundup product or something like that. Um, and we know how some people feel about Roundup. Um, on that, if those areas are done and, we, and, and, and the associations inform that in order to control this weed, we're gonna have to kill out this much area, Maybe, maybe if the association's okay with it and, and it kills out turf, maybe they, we could get something where the association and, and the vendor, if they choose to have that control done, split the cost of replacing that turf. I don't think something that doesn't have control to be truly fair for one or the other to fully pay for. I mean, that's something that associations, I think, could work out with their vendors. I'm happy to talk on both sides of it as well if, if we need to. Um, I am here for you guys, and if there's something that we need to replace, we want it replaced. If we can get thicker turf to grow in, there are some areas out here that have some beautiful zoysia, some beautiful Bermuda grass. If we can get those turfs to fill in really, really thick, we almost absolutely don't have to apply any weed control. Weeds germinate when sun hits the soil. So if we don't have any sun hitting the soil and we have nice, thick, lush lawns, we don't have weeds penetrating those lawns. We may have very, very few. Um, so we, our goal is always to have a thick, lush lawn. And it's, that St. Augustine is kind of hard to get that with, with the way that it grows. Um, for our landscape beds, we use a non-selective control. Uh, I, I, I'm a fan of using non-selectives in landscape beds. However, it should be targeted sprays. It shouldn't be coming through and spraying the entire bed. There, there's no pre-emergent activity in that, so, so it should be targeted sprays. Uh, we've suggested to the vendors that perhaps they get a sprayer with a cup on the end to kind of prevent overspray and things like that that they could bring over top of a weed. Uh, and, and on that with the beds, my expectation of the vendors is any, any weed that is over three inches should be hand pulled or, done, or removed mechanically. As, as if you spray something that big, it's just going to leave a dead skeleton in your landscape beds, and that's kind of unsightly. I don't like it. I'm not a fan of it. Um, I like nice, clean, neat landscapes. Anything under three inches, if you spray it and, and control it, it's going to wither away into nothing and go away after it dies. Uh, so we're, we're trying to encourage better practices by our vendors as well. Some of them are responding really well, and some of them are a little slow on that uptake, but they're coming around, I think. Um, and getting getting scored weekly and inspected weekly with with a score i think is showing some improvement on that as well um next slide <laughs> our vendors do provide weekly reports to the presidents and pocs we've touched on these in some of our monthly meetings we do want them to put as much information in these reports for you guys as possible um, what i see right now when i currently go through them to me, there's not enough information in those, and I've done examples. Keith knows I've done examples for the vendors to fill out. We just want to make sure that they are providing you guys with as much information as possible. The more information you guys have, the more and the better you are to, to handle a situation that may come up. If, if they're identifying areas that may have underlying conditions and that's causing turf to die out, they should be informing you guys if there's areas where flooding is, is a consistent problem and we're constantly having a fungal issue in these areas. They need to let you guys know, and I would expect them to provide a proposal for, for a solution to that, whether it be some drainage or something to be done. And, and that's not necessarily saying you guys have to commit to that, but it gives a, a budget, a number for you guys to look at and say, hey, we, we do need to do this, so may, perhaps we need to make something here, we need a budget for this so we can get this done and prevent this from happening. If vendors are identifying these areas, and, and I, I can't necessarily hold them responsible if the turf is constantly dying after they've identified these areas. Something has to be done on it. Um, it's just not fair to the vendor if they've identified an issue and, and it keeps dying and they have to keep replacing something. Anything that the vendors fail to report, again, if there's a drainage issue and fungus keeps happening, if they're not identifying it, then they are 
absolutely responsible for it 100 percent um i just want to make that clear they are 100 percent responsible for anything that they don't report and that's contractual as well uh, anything that they've treated um, should be on their weekly reports. So, and anything that they intend to do for the next week, whether it be an insecticide, an herbicide, a fungicide, um, prunings, anything that they plan to do should be on those reports. So they should be putting out there, we treated for weeds in this association. They should be informing you guys that you'll start seeing some die off or if they use a really strong product that may stress some of the St. Augustine, if it's gonna yellow out the turf. They should inform you guys that you may see some turf yellowing due to a chemical application that was applied, but the turf is going to recover. It's not going to kill the turf. We just want you guys, again, we want you guys informed as much as possible. The more information you guys have, the better you guys are equipped to deal with anything that may come up. Any proposals for areas that are underlying, they, they should be mentioned on the reports as well as sending the proposals to the president's POCs and stuff as well. Underlying issues are important. There are many out there that I've seen and I've been with vendors and pointed these out and said, if this is not reported, you guys are 100% responsible for it. Sometimes those issues still don't get reported, so they are still responsible. Um, areas that are, are too wet or too dry, those are supposed to be on those reports as well. Um, this is for you guys to get an idea of how the irrigation is being managed and maintained. It's also a tool that we use to help assist with identifying areas that are too dry or too wet for the master. Um, that, is, that way the irrigators or whoever, they may be able to go out and check and see if there may be a coverage issue or something like that. Our vendors aren't responsible for outlining irrigation times. We don't manage the irrigation. Um, go ahead, we'll go. things that our vendors don't manage irrigation the landscape landscape vendors and first service we don't have any control over irrigation our responsibility is simply too wet too dry and to inform the master of those areas that are too wet and too dry uh, vendors can't manage certain pests such as nematodes tree boring pests we know that there are some ambrosia beetles that are hitting some of the oaks right now um, that's causing signs of some, some oak wilt. It's a fungus that the, the, the pest produces that, that actually does damage to the, to the trees. Uh, any pest or weeds where there's chemical control isn't allowed in Florida. Again, I touched on this a little earlier with the torpedo weed. Um, nematodes, Florida doesn't allow nematicides to be used to control nematodes. Um, so that's, that's, that could be a costly control if, for an association if something has to be done for that to do it correctly. Um, exotic plants and annuals that owners may put in their in their beds um, our vendors aren't going to take care of or maintain anything that is not an exotic or an annual our vendors are absolutely going to maintain um, so please expect if you plant something that isn't considered an exotic or an annual that the vendors are going to maintain it so that's going to be pruned it's going to be shaped it's going to be kept in a, into a certain standard or at least it should be kept to a certain standard. Uh, fire ant control, that is not included in the contracts. I think that's something we may try to send again in the future on any future contracts. Uh, that's something that associations, and I know some associations out here have paid the extra to, to get the fire ants controlled and managed in their associations. I don't think that's a bad idea. I, I have been walking through associations and not paying attention stood on fire ant mounds and they they, they definitely hurt um, maintenance of the irrigation system so maintenance repairs installation of irrigation our vendors aren't responsible for at the moment either they are however approved vendors for irrigation so so if there is something that needs to be done or you guys want an enhancement or something such as like moving an irrigation head out of a bed to the edge so it's watering the turf and not being obstructed by shrubs might be a good idea to, to, to ask the vendors about that as well. Um, and, it, and also things that are irrigation related. If, I, if I'm seeing something out there, I definitely report it to Tony, who is the field manager for the Master Association. Tony and I, th I think we have a good working relationship. If he sees something for me, he identifies and lets me know. If I see something, I call him up and let him know as well. 
Uh, we'll both work out there at the same thing. If, if we can both get on a site at one time and we can see the irrigation running, if Tony sees something that may be under his responsibility, he will make a note of it and get upkeep ticket. If I see something that is landscape responsibility, such as a shrub or something like that blocking an irrigation head, we will take a photo of that, send it to the vendor, and make sure that the vendor takes care of that. That's also one thing that I make vendors responsible for. If there's a shrub blocking a head and the turf dies, that's on my vendors, I feel. So the landscapers should be able to identify that whether they're seeing the irrigation run or not. Uh, if they have the experience, they should be able to definitely step away and look and see if a head's being obstructed by a plant and then take care of that and prune that plant back. That is part of their responsibility. Uh, landscape budgets. Um, associations, I, I feel landscape budgeting is important. I, living, living, when, when I've, I've had my own houses across the country, um, I, I, I always budget for landscape improvements in my, at my home, things like that. I'm sure you guys did when you owned your own homes before you came into a COA. Everybody kind of budgeted for their landscape, what plants they wanted to plant in it and things like that. Uh, budgets are not a bad thing. We do have dead and dangerous trees that are out there that we do have to budget for removals. Um, I know in a lot of these older associations, there are quite a few dead trees that do need to be removed. Um, there, there are some where, where large branches are falling out of these trees, and, and if a vendor or, or a resident or, or anybody was walking under it, it could, it could be dangerous. It could kill somebody with some of these larger branches that I've seen fallen. Uh, replacement of turf in areas that vendors are not responsible for, um, such as some of these older associations. I know there's a lot of big bare areas in some of these older associations that have been pre-existing, and they are on the vendor's pre-existing list and notated. Some of these areas, again, constant weed control because we're going to constantly have weeds in those areas, kind of hinder our vendors. As professionals, we are only allowed to apply so much product on the ground in a year at a time, okay? So we have to keep logs of how much active ingredient we're applying. Sometimes we may be getting close to those thresholds, and once we reach that threshold, we cannot apply any more product. So the pests and things that are there are going to be allowed to run rampant because we can no longer control it. Um, so that's one thing I think it is really important to notate that if, if we hit that threshold, we can't do anything any longer. So, so having large areas where we have to put massive amounts of weed control down or, or more weed control than we have uh, begins to become a hindrance to our vendors and, and it hinders them from being able to do the job completely. Um, we want them to maintain the turf, not necessarily dirt. Oh, no. Uh, landscape upgrades such as lighting around monument signs, courtyards, um, things like that. You, you know, you guys can do these types of things and it does add value to the community and add value to your associations. Um, you know, I've seen some landscape lighting on some of the signs. I get in here pretty early. I was here at six o'clock this morning, drove through and, and got to see some of the lighting and stuff and, and things like that. Um, these are all things that we can all do to actually increase property value, increase beauty, and increase the enjoyment that we can have within the landscape itself. Like I said, I'm a huge proponent for being outdoors. I love the outdoors. I'm obviously tan. It's, it's, I, I, I'd like everybody to enjoy that outdoor space one way or the other. So there, there are things that you can enjoy in the evening. There are things you can enjoy throughout the day. We want the flowers there, we want the, the grass to be nice, we want lush, beautiful lawns. The more lush and beautiful a lawn is, the less product we actually have to start putting down on the ground and we can use it to target what we really need to target instead of those areas that are really bare or really thin. Um, if, if there's turf areas, small areas that may have died out, we do allow the vendor to an opportunity to try and get that area to fill back in. Um, and that's, that's something that they're not going to warranty, and that's something we don't want you guys to feel like you have to be responsible for either. 
So we do monitor it. I did ask the vendors to provide me essentially a timeline on how long they think it would take for a certain size area to fill back in. So we do have those timelines, and I do kind of hold our vendors to that standard. If there's if there's other issues that may may contribute to a, a reason why it doesn't grow as fast, then, then we take that into consideration, but we absolutely expect our vendors to proactively communicate that kind of stuff to us. If they're not proactively communicating to us, then, then they're not fully doing the job that they need to be doing. So working on that aspect as well, and I think in, for some vendors that's improving. Hopefully we can see it across the board and, and continue to work on that. We always want to elevate the ser service, not, not hinder it. So. Uh, work orders. Um, I'm going to kind of touch on this before Ma Bell goes into hers. Um, work orders through the Connect system, what we do want you to do is, is if you see something, we definitely want you to bring it to the attention of your president or POC. Um, that way they can go ahead and, and get something started in Connect or they can email me and, and I can get something started in Connect as well. Uh, if it's possible, take photos of the area that we can use. I mean, the more information we have for the vendor that we can provide, the better. Uh, we want to be as detailed in the description for, for, for the issue also. Um, the more detail we have in that description, the more we describe what we want the vendor to do, I think the better. Uh, not every issue it will result in a work order being created. Um, some things we may be able to just contact the vendor and, and just get it done quickly. If, if it's that, if, if it's for that. Um, things we don't want um, residents to do for work orders is, is call an issue in. Phone calls tend to get forgotten sometimes. If an email is presented or given, that makes me accountable. If you guys call me up and say, well, I sent you an email, and, and some of you have, and, and I've filed emails away, and I will go right back into them and look for that email, I never get rid of anything. So they are all there under a file for either the, the president's POCs or, or an association. So if there's something that you may have sent to me and, and we haven't gotten it resolved, just remind me and I will go back to the email, find it, and we'll make sure that it gets taken care of. Um, I, I, do, I do manage all 113 associations out here and that is a lot of property. Um, we don't want you guys going directly to the vendors. So we had an incident, incident in, in one association where a POC went directly to one of our vendors and asked them to cut down something that belonged to another resident. And that resident got kind of mad, but now our that vendor is responsible for replacing that item that they cut down. So please, please send those work orders in. And that was one thing that would not resulted in a work order. Okay, so that's one of those examples of something that will not be created as a work order if you call that in. Uh, send those in. That's a, that's, we want to track these things and know if our vendors are doing their job or not. This is a way for us to help identify that as well. Um, I, I've had residents that go out and do the job for the vendors if they've missed something. If they've missed something, we don't want you guys to do the work. You guys are here to enjoy life. Right? We don't want you guys to do the work. So please, please, please don't do their job for them. Send it to us so that we can grade them accordingly. Um, we need to know what they're doing completely, whether they're doing the contract completely or not. We don't want you guys to do it. We don't want you guys to maybe even accidentally injure yourselves or something like that trying to do something. And, and you know, I, I'm also willing to come out and help you guys out on some things and stuff as well. Um, we, we definitely need to know if they're not doing their job. So that they do get graded and, and they do get penalized if they aren't doing their job. And I think that's all I have for today. And I'll answer questions here at the end of the, the presentation. I just kind of wanted to get conversation started with some highlights here and, and a kind of a 30,000 view of what, what we take care of and what we don't. Um, so think about some questions for me here at the, before we're done, and we'll get those answered.
Thanks, Ryan. Arcelli's walking around with an extra booklet, so if, if you happen to need one, just uh, pop your hand up for get some over for you. Quite a few. Uh, next is going to be Ma Bell. She's going to kind of just go uh, briefly through the work order process uh, in general, so residents can understand, TSCs can get a better take on it, and then and how it all works from front to back. Um, and we'll just let her take over right now. Thank you, sir. If it's okay for you guys, I'll just sit down. Um, um, I didn't do the PowerPoint as well. So uh, to give a brief uh, introduction to the residents, some of them emailed me, they're asking what sections are there, what the associations are per section. So I have the handouts. If you don't know what section you belong, that will be um, on the handouts. So section one, I will not mention everyone. Section two, section three, and section four. So to start with the work orders, or we call it community website connect, this is only for board members only. Just to make sure I'm gonna clear it up again, connect or work order submission is only for board members. If you're not a board member, you just have to email it. I'll have the instructions later in my PowerPoint. Uh, connect is only for, if you will submit work orders in Connect, it only work again for only board members. I'm repeating myself. And residents, please report all the work orders to your board members. If you're going to email it to me, I will tell you, please contact your board members. And please apologize if I keep forwarding your email because we have a process here and we want the board members to know what is your request. That's why we're limiting it for the board members. Tell me if I'm speaking so fast. So this is a brief preview. I apologize to Acadia. I always use them because they made me as a board member in the website so I can use their samples or website. So, so this is the website. Every association, 113 association, you have your own community website or I call it connect. So if you are, don't have access in your connect, please contact your community association manager. Tell them, I need access on connect, can you please log me in or can you help me? They will give you the link of your website, your individual association website. If you try to use other associations website, you will not be able to because it will identify your address. So you need to make sure you ask your community association manager from First Service to give you the link or to send you the instructions how to sign up in Connect or community website. So one example is Acadia. As soon as the, as the camp sends you the link, this one will pop in. It says, welcome to Kings Point. And you're in the right place if you see your association on the side where it says, Example, Acadia Condominium Association. If it's not your association, tell your CAM this is the wrong association. Okay? That's a hint. The next thing you need to, know, to do is, if you are already log, uh, log in, is you need to click log in on the, sorry, you need to click log in on the right side. If you see all the way on the right side, I don't have a pointer today. Those are the login button. Again, it will only work if you're already signed up in Connect. If you're not signed up in Connect, contact your CAM again, okay? So click on the login button, and this page will show up. And I put on top there, your resident portal will appear first. If you're a board member or you're a resident, it doesn't matter. This is your individual um, address, you have your address, you have your name, and everything on that portal. As a resident, you can sign up as well in Connect, okay? This is the other thing that I'm encouraging people, if you don't receive anything from First Service, the mass communication that I sent out lately, please contact First Service to add your email address or contact your community station manager to send you the link to sign up on the community website. Okay, and this other thing will help the board member as well. The board member will have your contact number, your board member will have your email address and everything if you need, if they need to reach out to their residents. So I think that camera encouraging everyone to sign up in Connect. 
So if you need help on that one, please contact your community station manager in for service residential. And forgive me if I keep repeating myself. I know it's not lunch break yet, but my favorite thing is the hamburger button. <laughs> so I call it the hamburger button here is because the first, remember I told you guys, the first thing will appear is your resident portal. If you don't click on the hamburger button, as a board member, you will not be able to see anything. Okay, as a board member, there's a lot of capabilities you can see in Connect. You can see your financials, you can see all the residents, you can see most of it, which is uh, proprietary, you cannot share it to anybody. So, as a board member, you have those access. So your first thing you need to do is to click on the hamburger button. Always remember, hamburger button is your, your home, home, home page. So click on that one, and this pop-up thing will show up on the left side. And make sure you click on that key here, board view. If you don't click on the board view as well, you will, you will not go anywhere. So click on that board view, and it will pop up again. It will tell you the board view on the left side. As what I said, the hamburger button will be your home button. That will be your like basically every time you go back home, you click on the hamburger button. So to submit the work order, you click on the hamburger button again. And this one will show up. To remind you when you go to a hotel and everything, you're going to ring a bell. So there you go. I want a service. So click on that one and you want a service for your landscaper for anything for trees and everything to run, right? So we're going to do that. Click on that one and all your work orders that was submitted will pop in. Everything that was submitted before, um, whatever work orders you have. And you can tell here, Acadia has one work order was submitted on January 23rd, 2020. So in every association, you have all the list. So to submit a new work order, if you see on the right side, on my left side, there's a plus, red button. It's on the bottom when you open your screen, it will be on the right side of your screen. Click on that one and it will, like this, click on the plus button. Okay? As soon as you click on that one, this one will appear. So you have on that uh, select the categories and the best description, there's a pop-up button. It's like basically it's a scroll button. And you need to make sure you click on the landscaping, ground maintenance. And if you forget to do that, it's okay. It, because all uh, work orders will go to me and I can stream them mine too. But it will help us directly if you can find out. But if you are starting, just try, there's a, what is it called, an arrow button? An arrow button that will give you all the descriptions, whatever work orders you want to. But please click landscaping grounds maintenance or tree trimming side etc the most important as one ryan said is your description the reason i said that because when you log in in your community website it will pick up immediately the address of the person who submitted it okay example i will use to set miss susan if miss susan will have a request for her association her address will pop in immediately because she is the one who requested it Okay, so the thing that will help us is the description. You're gonna write down the address where you want the landscaper to trim the bushes, the trees that fell, any work orders. So this is the thing that will help us and help the landscaper as well to identify where are the work orders needs to be done. Be, don't be stingy on typing those words because more words, it means it's more information we give to the landscaper and more words for me to identify to which, uh, which work order you want. And then you can attach some pictures as well. So on the bottom, attach images. You can attach pictures. We are on the process. I know we have only one pictures right now, but the only thing I ask are, Sally, if, if you're submitting, uh, I'm gonna use Miss Susan again. If Miss Susan has five pictures, <coughs> she can just put one picture and she will just email to me the rest of the, the pictures because on my side, I can put more pictures. So we, we're in a well, working um, progress too, but that's the other way we can help you guys. And then as you can see, 
my email will pop in immediately. So if Mrs. and Robert submit the, the work order, her email address, her phone number will pop in immediately. Okay? And then after you submit the button, you will have a confirmation. Remember before when you open up, it will show up all the, uh, the work orders that you submitted. After you click the submit button, it will pop up immediately here that you submitted it. And as soon as you submit that button, it will be sent out to me and I will send it to the landscaper. Okay? And at end, as what I mentioned a while ago, for POCs that are not in the board, you can use the email. This is the email that you can use. Email at POC at FSResidential.com. Now, if you can remember, you feel free to email me as well. So I can just uh, input it because we have to create a work order for you guys. The reason I think Mr. Dave McGraw is here, the reason we created this work order is to track. Like right? in two years and three years, if something happened, we can still go back and connect and say, hey, this is the work order was done before. So I think that's the purpose that we, that two or three years ago. If you have any questions, feel, uh, feel, free, to, uh, feel free to contact me anytime. If I don't answer my phone, um, leave a voicemail or email me. Email is the best uh, thing because right now, if I won't be in the office, if you email it to me as soon as I get back to the office, I will receive your email and I'll try. I'll try my best to reply back to you. I'll try my best. If you leave a voicemail, I'll try my best to return your call. Okay? And again, if you need help uh, for board members that you have issues how to sign in, log in, in your connect, I think I walk some of the people through. Bring your equipment to my office. I will help you log in. I will help you uh, walk you through again. If I will, we will, as the first service, we're here to, to help you because it will be good for If the more training we have, the more it's easy for you guys. So again, we're here to help you and I think Keith will give more information that we're gonna do uh, in the future. That's it. Thank you, Mabel. Uh, just a little a precursor. So we are gonna be starting some monthly education and training with Mabel and Susan Green up in our office. Um, so there'll be one coming out in August and it will be all things connect, uh, work orders and signing up for click and pay. Um, so again, just another setting where Mabel will go through, you know, some different presentations on how to best utilize connect if you're a resident or a board member. Um, and also help residents if they want to help sign up for a click and pay, which is an easier uh, way to pay your monthly maintenance fees. I don't know if there's going to be hamburgers at each of the trainings, but um, we'll, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> uh, another precursor, what is going out this morning, if it hasn't gone out already, is going to be a letter to the presidents and board members of every, every association. Uh, basically, the letter is asking for input and help uh, and discussion about the new landscaping contracts. All the contracts will be uh, renewing April 1st of 2022, all together. So all four are lined up. We're looking to have streamlined, consistent contracts throughout. And we're reaching out uh, with the help of the, land, the Lawn and Landscape Committee to get input from the residents, from the board members. So we're asking you guys to talk to your boards, boards talk to the owners, and give us feedback on deliverables you're looking for, expectations. Uh, we're not looking for specific contract language, um, just specific deliverables and expectations that we can try to put into and craft into the contract and, and try to get the uh, expectation levels um, all the same throughout the community. Things like Ryan said about ant control. That's one item we're looking to say it would be best to have every, everybody have ant control because if one association does it, guess where the ants go? The other one. <laughs> so stuff like that is what we're looking at. So please uh, get, get that feedback back to us. Um, you can drop it off it, or email me directly, and we'll get it back to the Lana Landscape Committee. I know Dave McGraw's here. Thanks for stopping in. And we'll, we'll craft that as we continue the RFP process and the review process for that contract. I probably talked too much already, so what we'll do is we wanted to leave some time for questions and answers on, on anything landscaping, anything palm trees, anything work orders. Uh, so feel, feel free to come on down or do you want to? 
going to come right on down. We'll just kind of you come right down to the mic here. And Hi, Chris Robinson. I live in Portsmouth. Um, I've seen the uh, when, when the landscapers fertilize, uh, and mainly it's the um, the palms. They've got a cup that has the you know a certain amount that they're supposed to distribute, and they just throw it at the base of the palm. Well, shouldn't they be putting it out around so that the, all the roots get the nutrients? You're correct. Yes, Chris. Um, we're, we're, I've worked with the vendors on trying to get this corrected. Just last week I did observe, Russell's doing our, our palm fertilization right now, our extra palm fertilization. Um, so I, I kind of sit in the background and kind of watch where I can catch them doing stuff. Again, I'm going through 113 associations, I can't always see what they're doing. Um, this last time we're in constant contact and reminding them of how they need to apply this fertilizer. They need to follow best management practices, things like that. So I can't say in my most recent observation, I am, I am observing them actually going around around the trees now and, and, and shaking that out of the cup, not just kind of tossing it in yeah. there. So, that, I mean, that's one thing that we, we've seen and we've noted. Um, I, I've seen in doing my inspections that they have not applied enough fertilizer in some instances and I've made them go back and reapply extra fertilizer in those areas as well. So th these are things that we do try to look at and if, if we can manage it and, and, and get ahead of it or, or at least get it rectified, we try to do that as well. Just a, just a quick note about palm fertilization. Right now, Russell's Landscaping has two applications that they do for the entire community, all four sections. And each of your landscaper sections do two themselves. So it's, again, that's one of those contract items where we're going to blend it back to have one vendor do all sections so there's a little bit more control. Uh, right now you've got multiple different applicators going around, so we're gonna, that's something that the Palm and Tree Committee are, working, are looking at as well in, in conjunction with the Lawn and Landscape Committee. Preston True, uh, Lancaster One Director. Um, I've got three issues I'd like to bring to your attention. Uh, the first one deals with uh, uh, the mower scalping the grass. Um, we've had that ever since I've been here five years ago. It seems like each contractor comes in and they scalp the grass. I mean, and I, I go through the association almost on a daily basis, so I know what's going on. Okay. I've seen and, you out there walking. And that just irks me. <laughs> you, you and me both. Okay. The second is, again, down to earth. They one day had some leaky equipment and uh, went around on two or three streets. Of course, we can't, we can't do anything about the leaks on the street, but uh, we've got two or three streets that got these little trails on them. And uh, I was very upset about that, uh, that you know, that that the guys didn't catch it before they went all around the association. Um, and the last one is uh, the palm tree pruning. Um, Brown went through our area, uh, I believe the beginning of this month, and um, we've got a couple of palms that evidently uh, the guy was a little careless with his saw and, and uh, nicked a green one. And now we've got green frauds uh, hanging down. So, um, you so know. I'll, I'll answer your questions in order. Um, so as far as the scalping the turf, we do try to encourage our vendors to take the best path possible for mowing. They should be alternating their mowing patterns as well. That's what's best for the turf, what's healthier. Um, in areas where they know they're scalping, I. I it, depending on the mower that they're using, if they're on a stand-on, it's a little harder to automatically adjust the deck. If they're on a rider where they're sitting, they, they should be able to put their foot down. And this is what I always have my guys do for my companies was 
just raise that deck up with your foot a little bit while you're mowing to kind of keep from scalping that. That is one issue that we see, I see not just in, a, in your association, I see it throughout with all the vendors, not just down to earth. Um, I, I think some of the mower sizes in some of these areas are a little too large, and that's one thing we're looking at kind of correcting on these next contracts as well. Um, with, with the leaking, any, anything that's damaged, the vendors are supposed to absolutely inform us on. I, I was not made aware of that. Um, so if I go through and I see something on the roads, I don't necessarily know that it was my vendor necessarily. And if that was the case, and if they do any damage, they should be you know, repairing it, or if they have a leak, they should be cleaning that up. Um, that, that's part of their responsibility. Uh, with the palms, I, I go through and create punch lists for them to come and get these hangers. I've already been through Acadia. Browns does have a list of every address that I've been through, fronts, backs, and things like that. Um, before I get any other questions on palms, Browns is aware that they do have some backs that they need to come back and address. Um, just so you guys are aware, we don't pay them until the job's done. So. They, they aren't getting their check until those palms in the back are completed as well. Um, we don't want you guys to feel that, that they get away with doing half the work and get paid. That is absolutely not the case. I've got their check sitting in my desk, and they won't get it until it's complete. Um, so does that help you out a little bit? Yeah. Um, the last thing that I'd like to ask you about is um, we're having trouble with the master association on irrigation. We've got. I cannot them. touch it. I, I understand. All I'm asking is if you would have a company come in and give us an estimate on cleaning up their mess. Um, we've got an area that looks like it's been hit by bombshells and they don't seem to be working on it. They run red buyers through the grass that the mowers clip because they don't flag it. And this has been going on, and the, and the area is suffering, half of our association. Okay. So I want action. I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of, of the, you know, the master not doing anything and not being proactive on it. Um, you know, we need some help there before our area looks like a desert. I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards, and we can okay. come up with something. Okay. Thank you. Put it down here. How's that? <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. First question is: After uh, uh, re we request uh, or submit a work order, mm -hmm. how long does it take for you, someone, to get back to us? So work orders should be completed within three to five days. If they, if they go five days or longer, they get pushed to Keith or myself so we can look at and ask why these are not getting done. Um, that is the expectation, three days. Three days is my expectation. If, if we submit a work order, we want to see it done in three days. Okay. Um, we do track it internally. And, and if, there's, if we have to go out and ask why something wasn't done, then we'll ask why something wasn't done. Or, or if the vendor is waiting on another vendor to, to complete something, um, if they've been in contact, that work order might get closed, may get closed, um, but we still track it even though it may be closed. It's still there in the system and we can still track it. Um, I think Keith may have had something to add to that. Yeah, it, it is, it is uh, five business days in the contract for them to complete. Uh, the work order obviously some some items that are requested may take longer if it's a proposal or they need equipment so that's in consideration but they're supposed to respond back to the work order for us within three days and have it corrected within five days per the contract again we have an internal team that you know gets the work orders through the system and tracks it you know in a list and has the days to where they where they flag me and then we have conversations with uh, the branch managers in the area that's the work's not going to uh, okay, I'll have to resubmit then because it's been three weeks or at least. <laughs> right, and then to your well, other I'm point, only the to secretary, the other point, the president is out of town. He's up in he was up in Colorado, so we will do it again. Um, also, so one of the, the things we need is someone to come by and give us some advice of what has to be done, and 
That was one of the requests, and that had never been. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll, what association are you in? B, Highgate B, Highgate small. B. No. I'll uh, I'll get well. I, I will tell you that the 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 account manager that was over that section is no longer with Down to Earth. Um, so so the the account manager that is managing section four right now is divided between the two associations. Um, they are hiring another account manager to take over your, your association and I'll probably be working pretty close with him to, to develop the expectation of what needs to be done and things like that and, and working with him on actively communicating with you guys. Okay, uh, and the other thing is this, the mowers have to slow down because especially when the grass is wet, they dig it up. When it's dug up and got a big spot, it's dug up, it doesn't come back. So uh, the mower speed is something we're constantly telling you to be mindful of. Um, that 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 was a complaint ever from the beginning. I I agree with you one hundred percent. So I mean I I I've, I've had complaints with my own company about some of my guys going too fast on mowers in some instances. Um, and, and sometimes, I mean, yes, in the wide open areas, we may see them going fast. They shouldn't be. Just because a mower can cut grass at 13 miles an hour doesn't mean you need to drive the mower at 13 miles an hour. Um, it, we want we want quality, not quantity. Okay. And the only other thing, though, is the landscapers they've cut down a bush, uh, a bush in the common area, and. They left the stump. Now, do we have to put the, take the stump out and replace that bush, or do or is, we had no idea that they were going to cut it down? Yeah. If it was a dead one, then you guys it was dead. Yes, you guys would be responsible for that replacement. Yeah, they're not going to take the root out. Okay, so, but uh, we have to take the root out and replace the bush. That would be on the association. Yes, that's it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Charles Stewart from the Inverness Greens Association. Um, my question is uh, how plants are selected for the landscaping. And the reason this question has come up for me is that recently at Inverness we had uh, uh, evergreen bushes that died out and were taken out and then were replaced. The plant selected for replacement was jasmine bush and it raised a problem for me for the two reasons one is my wife is seriously allergic to the blooms <laughs> and the second was um, that the jasmine bushes that did get put in the, the jasmine seems to be more like a vine and so now the the jasmine is just growing all over the place and not really getting trimmed as i understand it it needs to be trimmed on a regular basis in order to become a bush but uh, so, the, so the, you know, selecting plants because of resident sensitivity and then the trimming of the plants. That, that's generally based on uh, an association decision. I don't get involved in that. That's an association decision. If there's one individual that may be allergic. I don't know if the association knows that or not. Yeah. Um, that, that's, but they're generally landscapers because it's a bulk contract, we aren't working around one individual or another. We're, we're, it's a bulk contract. So that plant selection was by the association? The, uh, the, uh, it, it would have to be an agreement between the association and, and the landscaper. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. I mean, I, when I found out uh, that the bush was coming in around my unit, I, uh, the day of the planting, which was kind of a problem, we, we did hit them off and we got an agreement that they would put something else in the back of our house there's still um, there's still something up front and i guess i guess from what i heard today the uh that trimming is it, supposed to have a more regular trimming i think uh, i'd have to just report to my president yeah well, we can we can make sure that it gets trimmed up but i would recommend reaching out to your your board your board president about the specific plant issue Okay, and, and and seeing if they'd make some kind of consideration, you know, for the for the allergy. So, okay, so that would be the best way to see if they want to consider replacing that with something else. Right. Yes. Okay. 
Thank you for your help. You're welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, that was a pretty nice uh, presentation. I enjoyed it. I have a problem uh, in my association. What association is that? It's Lancaster One. Okay. I had some uh, big trees cut down and they did not cut them deep enough. So I have bare spots, huge. Who cut them down? Bare spots. Who cut the trees down? The association. They needed to be cut down. I didn't hire them. Oh, well, I, it's, it's, that's on the association to pay for either the grinding. If they didn't pay for a stump grinding, that's on the association. It's not the vendor. Well, I've written two letters and complained several times. I mean, it's a huge... I, I, can't, I can't make them grind those stumps. So I have to live with it. I have to live with no grass on probably 25% of my front yard. And the neighbor next door had the same problem. And we, he we, has no grass either. We can, we can speak with your board and make sure they address your, your questions and see what plan is in place to address the stumps they, and sod. So. They did put sod down twice. It didn't grow. It's never going to grow. It dies. I don't care how much I water. Okay, so I don't well, know. I mean, I've talked you to them. You said you're Lancaster? One. One. Yeah, we can get with the board and, and talk to the board and see what they have, a, if they have a plan in place. Um, we can make the recommendation uh, that, that they do that. I, there's, I have no um, tools in my toolbox to, 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 to force that situation. Well, I would suggest in the future when they cut a tree down, they cut it down a little bit deeper so that you can have some grass to grow. What, what's your name real quick? My name is Audrey. Buckner, B-U-C-H-N-E-R, 2509 Lancaster. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda White. I live in Richmond, and I want to make a comment or a complaint, I guess, about trimming, landscape trimming. Um, I have a hibiscus tree or bush that's inside my unit. And when I bought the unit, the original tree had fallen down and was on the ground. I had that taken out. I had a second one put in. That died. Now I've got a third one in, and it's really doing well. The problem is trimming. When um, they came the last time to trim, the version of trimming is to across the top. I mean. You can't have people who mow doing the trimming. You can't have untrained people doing the trimming. Now I'm paying somebody privately to do the trimming. I've got a sign up. I put a sign up for the, when I hear they're coming to trim, I put a sign up telling them I can't trim it. I moved in here not to do gardening work. I moved in here and I'm paying a high fee not to pay somebody privately to come in and take care of the plants in my area properly. It, it's just, it's, it's not right. And they shouldn't, I, I blame the vendors. I mean, to come in and send somebody out and their idea of trimming is to take the top off. I mean, that's really bad when we're paying. I mean, I know we're paying these vendors a lot of money. Well, it depends on whether it's a rejuvenational pruning or not. Um, ag again, yeah, when, I, when, I, when I spoke on, on the hibiscus and the pruning, I am not a fan of shearing hibiscus. That's not best practice. Um, best practice is to hand prune the hibiscus, do heading cuts so you can improve growth on the hibiscus and make a fuller shrub. Um, I really I really question how much the people who come out and do the trimming, I question how much training they've had or if they've ever had any training. Because it seems to me it's just hacking away. They're, they're trained to do bulk contracts. That's generally how bulk contracts are done. Um, they are not personal gardeners. You're not going to get personal attention. You, you are getting bulk contract service, and that's just what it is. It's a bulk contract. 
I, it just seems like we pay a lot of money and we're not getting a complete service. That's what it seems like to me. I'm not saying they should be out there for an hour or two doing this and that, but right. they should not be chopping off the tops of funds. No, and, and I agree with you. I, I, did, I did say that in my presentation. Um, I, you know, they, they are going to cut bush shrubs like hibiscus all year, and they're gonna, hibiscus will bloom all year. Right. I, they just should not be shearing them or, or topping them like they're doing. It should be more shaping. It should take more care on shrubs that are like that. Um, you know, the ilex, they could, they could shear an ilex. Um, that'll take it, and, and that should have that box shape. Boxwoods, they could shear things like that, but definitely not hibiscus. Anything that's like that, I'm not a fan of shearing, and they should not be shearing those. And those, and those are contract deliverables that, that we can try to, you know, see if the community is wanting to change those at all. Again, when you're asking for, you know, more detail like that, it's more time, so it could be Well, even if you're not asking for more detail, at least Give it a little shape. I mean, just to hack off the top of everything just makes it, no it, sense at all. And, and it I think it must stress the plant. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Jane Norton, Nantucket 2. Don't fall over. I do not have a complaint about landscape. What? <laughs> <laughs> My question is basically about the, pro the Connect system. Okay. With the size of a company of first service, we cannot have the technology to have POCs who are supposed to be the ones entering for the boards, entering work orders on the Connect system. I, yeah, I don't and I think understand. Dave, Dave McGraw is here, and I think this has got brought up before in a, in a meeting that uh, when we were asked to track the work order system and implement something, what we were presented, we gave the free version. Um, and, I, and Dave, uh, he's, I think he's not in his head back there, but I, I believe there is capabilities or other systems out there to enhance uh, the workability of the system and, and the user access. Um, so that is something that we can discuss with the Landscape Committee um, and, and the Federation Board. Okay, one further follow-up. If one board member puts in a work order, the other board member can't see it. Right, that's generally why we have one POC or one. My one point member. exactly. <laughs> so, hey, J Jane? <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, he's behind you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, about a year and a half ago, when Mainscape left, they left with a really good work order system, and we were basically left with nothing for about a year. And the Landscape Committee at that time looked for systems. Uh, the first one was $42,000 a year to implement. The next two were in the $20,000 range, and first surface was for free. So th that's where we are at this point. No, it's I, free. I'm, so. not, I'm not arguing over the system. It's a, gr it's a system that works. My problem is that we have POC. So when you're okaying as a board member, you're clicking off all these dots that say the board members can have access to that area is there a way that they can just click on services for a poc and open up the work order system i'll, I'll try to see if our, our team that was can my change question that, yeah. i'm not complaining about the system the system works we just need to fine tune it so real real quick um i've heard i've heard the word complaint a couple of times i'm not a fan of the word complaint um, a, a complaint to me seems like it doesn't have any merit. That's a concern. That's an issue. Um, whenever you guys come to me, and, and many of you who've actually talked to me know that I don't like that word. You guys all have legitimate concerns out here. That's what they are. Um, I, I will never refer to something you guys bring to me as a complaint, so I don't want you to feel like it's a complaint. Okay? I'm not complaining. I was asking the no, question. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Susan Rabo from Manchester too. I'm dovetailing in on the Connect system. It works fine and I really think it works very well. I have one constructive criticism. And that being, I send out the work order to, fir to first service. I have two POCs that handle the property. Because I send that in, they have no knowledge that I'm doing this. Should there be a system where I don't have to cut and paste 
what I've sent in to you, so I could send it by email to the two POCs so they know what's going on in the system. Our board shares information, so can there be a carbon copy that I can send it to the two POCs so they're in tune with what they're looking at? So that's my constructive criticism. Okay, um, I think I did it six months ago. I said in the description, I don't know if you remember, I, I, I don't know if I, you guys remember, if you want someone to be CC'd on the work order, put it in the bottom, please CC this email address because I have the capability to CC everyone. So that's our thing too. So if you want, a, just, that's a description because again, as what I clarified, is only board members can submit work orders. But POC can too through the email. When we do that in the work order, so when you email us the work, the work order, I'll input the work order. Whoever submitted the POC, even though they're not a board member, they will receive an email verification that the work order was submitted. So if you have an email, you will, I don't know if you remember, any we, when we uh, follow up for three days, you will receive a verification. If the work order was submitted, as long as you have the email, we can work it out. Again, it's not a perfect, our, Again, as was Dave said, we started it with nothing before. And basically for service, customized work order just for the King's Point. Just to make sure we work clear on that one. We started from the scratch. There's no yeah, work I mean, order before from landscaping. I'll, I'll try to take uh, Jane's comments and see if we can work the POC system in there. And then for your case, if you would just put CC POCs on I have been putting C. It so happens the POCs are on my board. And what I'm saying, since I have seven board members, we communicate, we share. So when I send in a work order, the POC, who is also a director on the board, he should be aware of it. So I do put CC, if you see it on mine, but I don't know if you actually send that to Joe Schmo or the other guy. I, I put CC uh, into the work order, but I don't know if that really goes CC anywhere. On the description. In the description where I describe what the problem is, I always put CC Bill Gordon. Okay, so you want to CC Bill Gordon, okay. Okay, it's okay. on there, but right now what I'm doing, because I don't know if they're aware of it, I have to highlight, cut, copy, paste, send another email. It's more work for me. That's what I'm asking. We, we, can, we can get that corrected. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, Kurt Waska, Oakley Green. Thank you for the program today. Very informative. Um, and I also want to express my appreciation to Browns, who is willing to take palms out for $175, whereas DTE wants over $400 to take a palm out and grind a root. So I think that's great, great service to the community. So. I had to take about almost a dozen queen palms out. So Ryan, could you update us on the diseases and what's going on with, with palms? Thank uh, you. Diseases that I've, I've seen and identified in the community regarding palms it, are, are, are a couple of different ones. Um, and, and we can get pretty detailed or high level on this. Um, I, I'm, I'm a plant guy, I could nerd out on this all day. Um, but the two diseases that I'm seeing that are that are pretty prolific inside of Kings Point, one is is Ganoderma. Um, once a palm is infected with Ganoderma, there is no um, cure or, or help um, for that, and there, there's no preventative um, that we can do to prevent Ganoderma from infecting a palm. Um, the other disease that I do see going in, in the community is, is Fusarium wilt on the palms. Um, There's really, if it's caught early enough, there, there could be potential to, to save that palm from fusarium wilt. Um, there, there are studies that have been around, um, in Florida studies that have done some things, and if people really want to, are interested, we can get together after this and kind of go into some things that um, UFL has done um, regarding some of the diseases and things like that and prevention and, and stuff as well. But those are the two that I see throughout the community. Um, and most times the fusarium will actually doesn't get identified until it's a little too late. Um, how we identify that is we'll start seeing 
uh, fronds on palms will start to brown out on one side and we'll see one side of that frond look a little healthier than the other side. Uh, and then the other side will begin to come around as well. Uh, Ganoderma, it presents in a, in a couple of different ways. Um, that can cause the crowns of the trees to drop out. Uh, we'll see fungal, fun, fungal blooms or, or conks, we call them, um, on the bottom of the trunks, at the base of the trunks. And it, you know, once we start seeing that, it, it's, it's pretty much done. Uh, there, there are some pests out there, such as whitefly, uh, um, palm beetles, and things like that that will transfer disease and things like that as well. It's not quite as common, um, but gra uh, palms are a type of grass, so they are susceptible to pretty much the same diseases and things like that grass are. Um, the same things that will kill grass will kill a palm. And as, and as you come across Ganoderma that has a conch on it or a tree that is diseased, you know, please make sure you're, you know, either maybe letting us know, letting the landscaper know, and getting a qualified removal person out there because there are specific ways to take some of these diseased trees out, especially with with a conch. You know, it grows a, you know, nice little like conch looking shell on the side of the base of it, and if that's not taken off properly, it's susceptible to spread that disease to nearby trees in the area. So you want to make sure you're taking them out properly. And I think uh, I think we're reaching the 11 o'clock mark. So, is there any any other questions? We we really appreciate the questions. You know, we want to have another outlet for concerns, questions, complaints. Uh, so we appreciate everybody attending, and uh, hope to see you at next month's meeting. Thank you.